polls. I, I won't bore you by telling you how long Tom and I have known each other, but it's been a long time. <laughs> and uh, I'm very, I'm extremely proud of acquaintance all those years. Tonight, Tom's going to talk about one of the most interesting topics in all of science and certainly in all of physics and astrophysics. We're missing most of the universe, that is to say, all the stuff you see out there with the naked eye on the telescope or the radio telescope or any of that. It's only a small fraction of what we think is really going on, and that's what Tom's going to tell us about this evening. So I won't steal any more of his thunder. Let me just say that Tom himself, uh, at the present time, uh, is the science advisor for Governor Richardson, and that's a position not only of great importance, but also of great honor, and it's a testimony to his stature as a physicist. In real life, or in most of the time, Tom was a staff member of Los Alamos National Laboratory. He's had a long and very productive scientific career in neutrino physics and astrophysics, but also in the societal issues that face uh, physicists, and also in issues related to computation. So Tom has done a lot in, in, his, in his career, and uh, tonight he's going to tell you about a very small portion of it, uh, mainly we're missing most of the universe. So Tom, please. Okay, thanks very much, Bob. Um, certainly my pleasure to be here. This is one of my favorite subjects, uh, something I've spent most of my scientific career probing into. And if Bob can play uh, master of ceremonies here and, and hit things, uh, I'm going to tell you about two different areas which seem disconnected but actually are very intimately connected. And the first is, you know, what do we know about the smallest constituents of the universe, uh, quarks, leptons, electrons, things like that? And how is that connected to the entire universe, you know, the cosmology, what the fate of our universe is going to be? So, Bob, if you can jump right in. So, I want to start off by talking about the fundamental particles. And first off, I should just note, there's a question mark up here. Because there are theories which say these are not actually the most fundamental particles that we know, but these are made up of yet more fundamental particles. And all of that is driven by the fact that in science, the belief is that the universe should be simple to understand. I mean, in day-to-day -day life, it's very, very complex, but the foundation of the laws and principles in the universe should be very simple. And so, one of the questions is, why do we have so many different, quote unquote, fundamental particles? But this is what we know as of today. Um, leptons are, uh, are particles which uh, interact via electromagnetism. Um, they interact, uh, can interact uh, with the weak nuclear force, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But what we know is that there are three particles, electrons, muons, and tau particles, which are charged particles. Electrons, everybody is familiar with. Muons is, to first order, just a much heavier uh, electron. It, uh, this is the mass in, in GeV over C squared. And just for reference, um, one GeV is about the mass of a proton. So on this scale, a proton is about mass one. These others, the electron, is very, very lightweight compared to a proton. The muon is about 10% the mass of, of a proton. And a tau particle, which is yet a heavier uh, lepton uh, or electron type uh, particle, is almost twice as heavy as, as a proton. We don't know why there's three of these. Uh, in fact, there's a very famous question when the muon was first discovered. Uh, almost 100 years ago, 80 years ago or so, I.I. Uh, I. Robbie, who was one of the people who won the Nobel Prize, said, you know, ask the question, whoever invented that? Because we still don't know why we've got a heavy electron, basically. But connected to the electrons is something that I've spent most of my career studying, which is neutrinos. So neutrinos have no charge, no electrical charge. They are interact only... Uh, until very recently, we knew they interacted only during, through the weak nuclear force. 
And so neutrinos are everywhere. They're made in radioactivity, they're made by the sun, they're made in supernovas, they were made in the Big Bang, and they are extremely weakly interacting. <clears throat> they basically pass through the Earth like the Earth was a piece of glass. So from the sun, from the fusion reactions in the sun, there are uh, 60 million neutrinos a second going through your thumb. 60 million neutrinos every second go through your thumb. And maybe one time in your entire life, one of those neutrinos will actually interact. They'll change one of the particles, one of the atoms or nuclei in your thumb to something different, to a different nucleus. So to all practical purposes, they're almost impossible to observe. And so that's what I've spent my life doing, is trying to observe these things. Uh, it's, it's very difficult, and I'll show you how we do that later on. But these are the leptons. Uh, they have an intrinsic spin, so sort of like a particle, like a top spinning around. They're quantized. The spin is at a certain level, a uh, certain quantification. So these things are quantized. And we talk about spin because they follow the same rules of angular momentum as classical particles do. So these are the leptons. The quarks are the strongly interacting particles. They have mass. Uh, they interact, both of these uh, interact by gravity. These interact via the strong nuclear force. The two particles that make up essentially all of ordinary matter around us are the up and down quarks. They're very light. They're only uh, a fraction of a percent of the mass of, of a full proton and they have a charge, so, and they come in pairs here. There's also the charm and strange quarks. Uh, these are named for various reasons, people who, uh, who discovered them. The charm quark is a little bit more heavier than the mass of, of a proton. <clears throat> the strange quark, again, is about 10%. And then there's some very heavy particles, the top quark and the bottom quark, 173 times uh, the mass of the, uh, of the proton. These make up all of the ordinary matter that we know around us. Uh, next slide, Bob. <clears throat> but there's another part of the universe, which is what is the force, you know? What communicates between particles? And this is actually done by particles. They're called bosons. And instead of having a spin of a half, they have an even numbered spin, zero, one, or two. This makes them fundamentally different. So, Almost everything that you see around you is mediated by the photon. It's a massless particle, it has no charge itself, but all of chemistry, all of solid state, uh, all of matter around us is mediated uh, by the photon. Then there are two other forces. There's a weak nuclear force. This is basically what causes natural radioactivity or certain types of natural radioactivity. These things are very, very massive. And because of that, when they are created, they only last for a very, very sm small fraction of time. And that's what makes the fact that these are so heavy is what makes this force so weak. There's three types of this uh, with charges, a negative charge, a positive charge, and a neutral charge. And then what holds everything together are called gluons. So this is the glue that holds nucleus together. And so any nucleus that you have with a bunch of neutrons and protons, it would fly apart because of the electric charge in it, except for the fact that you have these gluons holding it together. Bob? <clears throat> so if you look at the four forces, you can see what they act on. So gravity acts on all types of mass. It acts on energy because, you know, from Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared. Energy and mass are fully interchangeable. Um, it is mediated by a particle called the graviton. We've never observed the graviton, but we very much believe it exists. Uh, and it's a very, very weak force. So you need the entire you know, mass of the Earth to hold us down uh, you know, on the surface of the Earth. If this was any stronger, you know, life couldn't exist as we know it. The weak interaction. <clears throat> Um, which interacts both on quarks and leptons. Uh, it's mediated by these particles. It's weak, but, you know, uh, much, much stronger than the gravitational force. But the range is very, very small. So here, if you look at 
uh, a distance which is the size, uh, uh, smaller than the size of a nucleon of a proton, at very close range, it has a lot of strength. As you move further away, as you move the particles further and further away, the strength dies off very, very quickly. The electromagnetic interaction, uh, it acts on anything that's electrically charged. Uh, it's mediated by the photon, and the strength here is just set at unity, is set the scale for everything else. The strong interaction, the gluons that hold things together, is very interesting because uh, different than any other force that we know of, as you move the particles apart, the force gets stronger and stronger and stronger. So here you see at 10 to the minus 18 meters, it's got a strength of 25 compared to electricity and magnetism. You move them three times further apart, the strength goes up not quite three times, but it keeps going up and up and up. So it's a very sort of strange uh, interaction. Bob? <clears throat> So one thing that you need to know about in order to understand what's going on in the universe also is how particles interact. And so there's two types of interactions I want to uh, stress here. One is decay of particles. So in free, uh, in, in nature, the neutron is not stable. It lasts for about 10 minutes and then it decays. It decays into a proton, an electron, uh, and an electron antineutrino. And it's mediated by this intermediate vector boson, uh, this W minus that's shown here. So that's one form of, uh, of interaction, namely decay. If time were running backwards, you actually could bring these particles together and make a neutron. So if you had a proton, an electron, and, an ant and a neutrino, you could turn the reaction around and make a neutron. If you have enough energy, uh, you can do that. Um, the, the other process is annihilation and production of particles. So a particle and its antiparticle. So an electron and a positively charged electron called a positron can come together. They annihilate to form either a gamma or a neutral boson, a Z. Those particles then can uh, decay and form other particles, but you always form a particle and an antiparticle when you do this. And this turns out to be, these two processes turn out to be very important in understanding why our universe is full of matter and not antimatter. So next slide, Bob. <clears throat> so we're going to start off with just what we're used to around us everywhere. We've got a nucleus, uh, which has neutrons and protons in it. Those neutrons and protons are made of up and down quarks. And then there is a swirl of electrons uh, circling around the nucleus. Um, the electron is, is, as far as we know, a point source, very, very small, uh, if it has any size at all. And everything that you see in the room around you, everything that you're used to uh, in, in the universe, basically is of this form. So the real question is, why is this such a rare beast? And I'll talk about that. So, Bob, next slide, please. So there's a number of really important questions in modern physics that we're trying to answer, scientists are trying to answer. The first is, what's the fate of the universe? We know it started off from a big bang, it expanded outward. Is it gonna expand forever? Is it gonna sort of coast to a slow stop? Or are we gonna have what's called the big crunch where the universe expands out? and then contracts back, uh, and you have just the opposite of the Big Bang. Second question is, why is there no antimatter? We know at the beginning of the universe in the Big Bang, you made the same amounts of matter and antimatter. So what happened to all the antimatter? If we look out in the universe, we know from looking at various particle interactions, decays and so on, that the universe is made mostly of matter. It's not that this part is matter and that part's antimatter. It's that the whole universe is matter and there's no antimatter left. So what happened to the antimatter? The third question is, we found out, and I'll talk about this momentarily, that there's a lot of stuff in the universe which is not all the stuff, the atoms, that we're used to around us. It's matter, it has weight, it has mass, uh, it interacts with things, but it doesn't give off any light. So what is it? 
Last question that we're actually not going to talk to the, about today is, what's the origin of mass? How come particles actually have mass? How come we weigh something? We don't know the answer to that either. There's a few others. Uh, one that I've been involved in is, for example, why does time only run in one direction? Why can't you turn time around? Turns out that there are some fundamental reasons for that. Uh, there are processes that we know you can't obviously do that, but we still don't know why you can't do that. But I want to go from posing these three questions about what's the fate of the universe, what happened to all the antimatter, and what's this dark matter stuff out there in the next slides. And so I'm going to transition now from sort of particle physics to uh, cosmology. Talk about starting off at the Big Bang and where we are today. So in the Big Bang, there was uh, an explosion, incredible explosion. Started off smaller than the size of a proton, expanded out and formed the universe that we see today. Um, that happened, we, we, we can look at those processes back to um, 10 to the minus 30 seconds. So a, a billionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second. We can figure out what happened back that far. We don't know how to calculate what happened when the universe was that much smaller. So in the time that it went from, uh, from something the size of a proton expanded outwards, this giant explosion forming the universe, if you get up to a millionth of a second, uh, by that point the universe had expanded out to be, I don't know, a fair fraction of the size of the Earth. At that point it was still hot. You had all this energy in the universe. It was extremely hot and it was made up just of quarks and gluons. It was so hot that if you tried to make anything else, you just disintegrated. It just broke apart immediately. So you had something called the quark-gluon plasma. As the universe expanded out more and more and more, the energy content in it was constant, but as it expanded out, the energy density, so the energy in each part of the universe, just dropped off more and more. It cooled off, so it dropped from uh, a trillion degrees Kelvin uh, down to less than uh, a trillion degrees Kelvin, down to, you know, the three degrees Kelvin uh, that we know today. So at 10 to the minus four seconds, you started being able to have the quarks come together and form neutrons and protons. A little bit later, so three minutes into the evolution of the universe, those neutrons and protons started to make helium, some of the high, uh, started to make uh, deuterium, helium, lithium, some of the very low mass uh, nuclei that we know. So this was three minutes into the universe. 400,000 years into the universe, everything had cooled down enough that atoms could now form. So you could attach electrons to the nuclei and they wouldn't just get blown off. About uh, 300 million years into the universe, we started making stars. So gravitational attraction had collapsed uh, the hydrogen and deuterium, helium into stars and you started to light up the universe. And somewhat later you started to have these stars, they had been formed. Many of the stars at the beginning of the universe were very, very massive. They burned through all their nuclear fuel very quickly and they made supernovas. And that's very important to us because without that we wouldn't be here today. And the reason is that when you form stars and you burn through the stellar reactions, the thermonuclear reactions, you can make everything up until iron. You get up to iron, iron is the most stable nucleus that, that exists in the universe. After that, you need some other process to make anything heavier than iron. So all of the heavy elements in, you, in, in our bodies which are required for life came because there were supernova explosions that made these very heavy elements and blew them out into the universe. So, you know, you, you hear this statement, we're sort of star children. Well, it's absolutely true. There is stuff in your body which came out of stars, which were born, died, blew up, and spread those heavy elements out across the universe. And then, of course, today uh, we're in a relatively cold universe. Bob, uh, first button. 
If we go back and look at each one of these, what happened at the very beginning of the universe is something called inflation. The universe just expanded out in a violent explosion. It was an exponential explosion. And the universe grew by 26 orders of magnitude. So 100,000 billion billion times in less than, uh, than, a, than one uh, a picosecond, so a millionth of a millionth of a second. This turns out to be very important in how the universe was formed, what we see going on, because there were uh, quantum effects going on here that set the stage for what the universe currently looks like. Next. <clears throat> here around uh, 10 to the minus 4 seconds, so the point where neutrons and protons were formed, all of the antimatter in the universe had disappeared. And we know generally how this happened, but we don't understand the specifics of it. What happens is that matter and antimatter, so these decay processes, these annihilation processes that I talked about earlier, they can go both directions. So they can decay, they can turn around and reform if the universe is hot enough. But as the universe is expanding out, it's cooling down, and what happened is that antimatter decayed a little bit faster than regular matter. And so all the antimatter decayed away, and before it could turn around and form more antimatter, the universe had cooled off too much, there wasn't enough energy to drive it in the back direction, and so antimatter decayed away, and we were left with uh, a universe full of matter. Exactly how that happened is, again, one of the, the real puzzles of modern physics. Bob? The next thing that's really relevant for the universe is the point where you started forming neutral atoms. So 400,000 years into uh, the universe, after the universe was born, atoms could form so that you could get electrons attached to them and they could be stable. Up until that point, you had this process of light being emitted, light being reabsorbed. Now at this point, Atoms were formed, they emitted light, they started cooling down, and they weren't reabsorbing light. So at this point, we had uh, a phenomenon called freeze out. The photons going back and forth, driving these reactions in both directions, no longer could go in the back direction. And you were left with this radiation filling the universe of light, and it just stayed there. It no longer could go back and form particles. And that expanded out. And this, by looking at this cosmic background radiation, we can look back to within 400,000 years. We can directly look back to within 400,000 years of the birth of the universe. Bob? <clears throat> and then finally, as I noted, the formation of heavy elements. Uh, this is something which was crucial to the growth, subsequent growth of stars uh, and their subsequent evolution. And as I said, essential to the formation of life on our planet. Next one. So if you look at this with time going this way and space sort of length scales going transversely, you had a big bang here, incredibly small. It grew exponentially. It grew incredibly fast. There were quantum fluctuations in here, so not everything was smooth and homogeneous. There were little patches here which were uh, hotter and colder. Uh, it came out, inflation ended, and then the universe has started expanding the way that we're used to, galaxies moving apart and so on. And this cosmic wave, uh, cosmic background radiation, uh, microwave background radiation, came, kicked in at about 400,000 years. And these quantum fluctuations are reflected here. You see parts of the universe of the light coming out from different parts of the universe are hotter and cooler. There's a period called the Dark Ages. It was called dark because stars hadn't turned on yet. There were no stars generating light. Um, that lasted to about 400 million years. Then we started forming stars, galaxies, planets, etc. And lo and behold, we have the universe that we observe today. And the real question is, what does this curve here look like? Is this turning over and coming down, or is the universe expanding uh, more quickly, or is it constant, Bob? <clears throat> we have ways to measure that. And the way that we do it is by looking at distant objects and the light coming in from them. 
And everybody's familiar with the Doppler shift from cars or trains, horns, you know, as it's coming towards you, the pitch starts to rise. And as it's going away, dies off. Same thing happens to light. The wavelength gets compressed or stretched out depending on whether you're coming towards you or away from you. Well, in the universe, most things are moving away from us from each other because the universe is expanding. And so what we see is a shift to the red. Red is a longer wavelength, uh, lower energy. So by looking at different parts of the universe and seeing how much they're shifted, we can tell if they're moving towards us or away from us. Bob? And, and the way that we do that is that atoms and stars give off light and they absorb light. And so if you look at the elements, the absorption levels are quantized by the rules of quantum mechanics. And as light comes through emitted from the surface of a star, some of it gets absorbed by the atoms in there and it gets absorbed at very specific wavelengths. So what we do is we look to see what the wavelength looks like in the laboratory here on Earth. Then you measure what's coming from a star and as those things are shifted, red shifted out, you can tell what the relative velocity between you and that distant star is. Bob? So there's something called Hubble's Law, which talks about the expansion of the universe. And it just says that the velocity of distant objects just scales linearly with their distance. So the further they are away, the faster they're moving away from us. And this tells you what the redshift is, z. This is just the definition in terms of the wavelength of what you're observing here and the wavelength in the laboratory. And the velocity is tied to this factor z. Bob? <clears throat> so when we look at our own uh, solar system, essentially all the mass in our solar system is in the sun. It weighs, you know, 99.99999, some long number out there. All the mass is in the sun. And you can predict from that, knowing what the mass of these uh, planets are and what their distance is, how fast they have to be going around the sun to be in a stable orbit. And that all follows a one over R law. So Mercury's going around the sun the fastest, Pluto's going around the sun the slowest. So this is what you would expect if, for any system where all the mass is at the center of the system. So astronomers have gone out and looked to see what's going on in our galaxy. Does it look like the same thing? So you look out to the edges of the galaxy. Uh, these are our closest uh, neighbors. This is the Andromeda galaxy with two small uh, satellites on it. And you can look out and you can see stars of certain size. You can tell what size they are by the type of light uh, they give off. And then you look to see how fast they're moving around. And from that you can calculate this rotational curve, which if all the mass for a star here was in the center, which is what you would expect, it should follow that same thing. Well, when people did that, they found something very surprising. Instead of coming down like this, it goes up like this, which says as you go further and further out, there's more and more and more and more and more mass out there. The problem is it's not giving off any light. You know what the distribution of stars is. If you look at the distribution of stars, you would expect this to come down like this. In fact, it's doing just the opposite. So the conclusion from this, Bob, <clears throat> is that there is far more matter in galaxies than in the stars, gas, or dust that we visibly observe. The matter doesn't emit light. That's why it's called dark matter. It gravitationally interacts. It's there. It's like a big halo filling the entire, all of the galaxies around us, and in fact, superclusters of galaxies. We don't know what it is. It's dark, but it has a lot of mass far more mass than what's in the visible stars. Bob? If you take that the next step out, you don't look at close by galaxies, but you look to see what's going out in the distant universe, what's happening in the distant universe, you can go out and survey the universe, look to see what it looks like. Are there these clumps of dark matter spread throughout the universe? And so there is a group called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, Bob was connected with this uh, from the NSF when he was there. 
And they built and set up a telescope, two and a half meters, so about uh, an eight-foot telescope down at Apache Point, southern New Mexico. Uh, you know, and you want a really neat camera, you know. Really, really good cameras now have like 10 or 12 megapixels. This one's got 120 megapixels. You, you can't buy this, you know. Well, you could buy it. It only costs you about $5 million probably. Uh. <clears throat> But it's taking very, very detailed pictures of the night sky, and it's looking out at distant galaxies far, far away and measuring their redshift. And the goal is to measure the large-scale structure of the universe. And what I want to show you now is a film that was made by this group. And the interesting thing about this is this isn't sort of a thought process or a virtual film. This is real data of galaxies with their images that were taken down in southern New Mexico and put together. And so we're going to start at our own galaxy, start moving out towards the edge of the universe and looking at all the galaxies out there and seeing what it looks like. <clears throat> so I had to do this separately because this is a 1.8 gigabyte file. And when I tried to put it into PowerPoint, it only took like an hour to play this thing. Shift F. <clears throat> so this is mapping the universe with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. They looked at more than half a million galaxies uh, and a lot of quasars far out. And so we're going to start here very close to ourselves. We're moving out away from the Earth. This is the local galactic supercluster. And these are all actual images. These are the actual galaxies which sit out there. As you move out, you start to see distant galaxies here. Some of them have different shapes. You start to see a little bit of structure here. There's some holes, some gaps. We're now about one billion years out from our Earth. You start to see the red quasars coming in. As you move further and further out, you see more and more quasars. The galaxies have not yet formed. We're now about two to three billion light years out. And now you can see the universe is not smooth. This structure up and down is just because that's what they looked at primarily from the telescope. But this stuff out here, you see these bubbles, you see these voids, you see these sheets. And when you look at this in 3D, which I couldn't do here unfortunately, in about a year we'll be able to do that here, but you can see these bubbles, these sheets, uh, these rods. These were formed initially by quantum fluctuations, but then dark matter is what really solidified those. As we move further out, this is the cosmic background radiation. This is 14 billion years back in the universe. And this is real data also. People looked with satellites. They mapped out the light coming from when atoms were finally stable. The red is where it's a little bit hotter, one millionth of a degree hotter. Blue is one millionth of a degree cooler. And so what you see here in the center is we can look back with this data out to about four or five billion years to the, uh, in time. We just don't have enough sensitivity yet to look out beyond that. But satellites have been able to look back to almost the beginning of the universe. And so this is telling us that the universe isn't just smooth and nice and even. There's all this structure. There's these bubbles. There's these sheets. There's these strings going on out there. And we're trying now to understand how does dark matter form this sort of structure together with inflation and the quantum fluctuations. Bob, can we go back to the PowerPoint? <clears throat> and you know, so I find this just truly amazing because usually you see computer simulations of things. This is the universe as we observe it uh, from data taken here uh, in southern New Mexico. So if you can come up to here, <clears throat> to 13, or next one, yep. <clears throat> next one. So the other way that we can look at things is not just by looking at the structure, but we can look at supernova. This is a picture of the Crab Nebula. Uh, it went off in, I think, 1054 AD. Um, very spectacular. Uh, it's in our own galaxy. But there are types of supernova which the, the stars which are going to supernova have a certain type of composition which you can determine by looking at the light coming from them. And all of those stars, they're called type 1A supernovas. 
they all explode exactly the same way. So independent of where they are, if a type 1 supernova goes off, you know how bright it intrinsically was. Bob? And so if you look out at distant supernova, <clears throat> they all have the same intrinsic brightness. They can serve as what's called a standard candle. And by observing their redshift, we can determine their distance. Next one. So people have gone out and done this. And this slide, unfortunately, when I copied it, uh, wasn't such high resolution as I wanted. But what it shows you here is the average distance uh, away from, uh, from Earth. And this is time in billions of years. So 14 billion years back in time is here. And what happened is the universe started off very, very small. So this is the distance between uh, particles. It quickly expanded. It started to slow down because gravity was slowing us down. So slower and slower and slower to the present point. And people have looked back at these supernova, <clears throat> and they can look back to about 5 billion years or so, so far. And they can trace out their trajectory here, and then they can project it into the future. So there's this yellow trajectory. It's a little bit hard to see. But if the universe was closed, this trajectory would come up across here. The universe would expand out. It would fall back in on itself. You'd have this big crunch. If it ran right along the edge of the gold region here, we just expand out and out and out very, very slowly. All the data is telling us that this line here, a little bit hard to see, but here's the yellow line, is that the universe is actually, it blew up, expanded very, very quickly, started slowing down, and then it started speeding up again. Right now, the universe is speeding up. We don't know why. Next slide. So this just shows you basically what I was saying. <clears throat> there was acceleration during the inflation, during the very early part of, of the universe. Then gravity started slowing everything down. And then uh, a few billion years after the universe was formed, uh, 5, 10 billion years, it started speeding up again. So next one. <clears throat> and this is what we know from putting all of that data together <clears throat> about what's in the universe. So heavy elements, heavy means anything higher, uh, heavier than helium, contributes tiny, tiny fraction of a percent. Neutrinos, and I'll talk a little bit about this, form another part of the universe. Neutrinos are dark matter. They don't give off light. Stars, all the visible stars in the universe only have half of 1% of the entire mass of the universe. So when you look out, Nice dark night here. You see all the stars out there. You're only seeing less than 1% of what's actually out there. The rest of it you can't see. Other things, hydrogen, helium, dust, gas, everything else, we know from observations don't make up more than 4%. So everything that we're used to seeing around us accounts for less than 5% of the universe. 25% of it is this dark matter. It's these particles. We don't know what they are. Neutrinos is one little part of it. We don't know what this is, except that it's matter. It interacts. Uh, it's filling the universe, uh, but, but not evenly. Counts for 25%. Dark energy, which is the force, it's like an anti-gravity. It is accelerating, pushing things apart. Accounts for most of the energy uh, in, in the universe. We don't know what it is either. Bob? So people are trying to figure out what it is. There's a couple of different ways you can go about probing this. One is you can try to recreate the conditions during the early universe. And so that's what physicists with these giant accelerators do. This is an accelerator out on Long Island. It's called the Relativistic Heavy Ion uh, Collider. It's basically trying to recreate the Big Bang and make a quark-gluon plasma. It starts off uh, a small accelerator here. It strips uh, electrons off of gold atoms, accelerates them, takes them down uh, almost a mile. There's a ring here where they circle around. They get sped up, puts it into a bigger ring, gets spread up here, <clears throat> gets ejected out here, and goes into this ring out here, around which there are uh, a number of detectors located. And so what happens in this, Bob, uh, if you can hit the button, <clears throat> is you accelerate one pulse of 
gold in this direction, another in this direction. They hit each other. They make this giant, well, not giant, very energetic explosions, very, very small, uh, extremely small size. But the energy density of that is so high that you can recreate the conditions, you know, a fraction of a second after the universe was born. You can make this quark gluon plasma. These particles decay. They generate other particles which come out of it. So a gold atom hits a gold atom, makes this plasma. The plasma degenerates, gives off these particles. And on the average, you get about 20,000 particles coming out of this one collision. Uh, Bob? This is one of the detectors. Uh, this is Los Alamos National Laboratory, which is where I'm from, is involved in this collaboration. So one beam of gold comes in here, the other beam of gold the other direction. They get focused down to something much, much smaller than the size of a hair. Once in a while, one of them will hit each other. They make these particles which come out. And this detector has been opened up, but you can start to see some of the elements of it. Uh, if you look from the side, Bob, <coughs> uh, the collision happens here in the center. Particles stream out, and there are detectors set up around the, the two ends of, of the, the interaction. Next. <coughs> this is a wire chamber, so there are gold wires strung across this, filled with a gas. So when a particle goes through this, it makes a little pulse, and it tells you exactly where it went through this. Next. <coughs> On the outside, there are tubes which again, when a particle goes through it, they register a pulse. They tell you what type of particle, in part, what type of particle it was. So you get an idea of the size of things. Next one. <clears throat> uh, this is a ring imaging Cherenkov counter. So there is a gas in here. When a particle goes through it, it gives off a pulse of light. And you collect that pulse of light, turn it into an electrical pulse. Uh, next one. <clears throat> and when you put all this together, this is what happens. This is an actual event. A gold atom hit another one here. These are all the particles which came flying out of it. Um, and the job of the physicist is to reconstruct which particle here went with another particle here, because you make a particle and an antiparticle uh, doing this. So trying to put this back together takes a huge amount of computing. But people are now getting to the point where they can study what went on during that very early phase of the universe, and we're starting to unlock the secrets. So that's one way, sort of brute force. <clears throat> you slam two things together, really high energy, and you see what happens. The other way is a little more, uh, next one, Bob, uh, a little more subtle. Uh, this is one that I've been involved in, and this is looking at neutrinos. Uh, in the center of the sun, there are fusion reactions Two protons come together, they form deuterium, they emit neutrinos, there's other elements made. All those reactions give off neutrinos from the center of the sun. And in coming from the sun to the Earth, they can change. You remember there were three types of neutrinos, electron, muon, and tau. So it's like an apple starting off from the sun, changing into an orange, changing into a peach, you know, later on. Now, you don't see that thing in normal everyday life, but when you get down to the quantum world, it happens. And what's required is that the particles have masses, and what it tells us is what the difference of the mass of those two particles is. Next one. So I've been involved in a couple of experiments, uh, one in Russia in, in a, uh, an underground mine uh, where I worked with, uh, off and on with the Russians for 20 years. I spent about better part of two years of my life underground, uh, just next to Shechnia you know, in a mine in Russia. Um, this is a mine, an active nickel mine up in Sudbury, Canada. Uh, a meteor hit the earth uh, about a billion years ago, dug out a huge cavity which has filled up since then. But all along the side, there is nickel and, and other precious metals. So there's a mining operation here. And down here, a mile and a half underground, we built a neutrino detector. And so we're looking at the sun from almost two miles underground. And the reason for doing that is that there is a lot of natural radioactivity. There are cosmic rays coming in from space all the time. Our detector is so sensitive, they would just you know, light up the detector and saturate it. You have to get away from them. They're very energetic. So you go deep underground. So we have a solar observatory using neutrinos 
a uh, mile and a half underground. That has uh, an acrylic vessel sort of the size of this room, not quite, but almost. <clears throat> it's filled with heavy water, a thousand tons. Heavy water is just like regular water, except the hydrogen has an extra neutron on it. And it's worth $300 million. The Canadians loaned it to us. Uh, we had to insure it, Lloyd's of London. Uh, but that's in the middle. Neutrinos can come in, interact on that. They give off flashes of light. We surrounded this thing with photomultipliers where a pulse of light comes in. It's like the opposite of a, te of a television. Television, you send an electron, it gives you a flash of light. This, you have a flash of light coming in, it makes an electron. Next one. <clears throat> and the reason we use heavy water is that there's different interactions with different signatures that tell us whether it's an electron type neutrino, whether it could be any type of neutrino, or some combination of it. So from this, we can sort out what's an electron neutrino and what isn't. Next one. <clears throat> This is when we're building it. So there is an 11 story high cavity. We excavated uh, a mile and a half underground. And this is a working nickel mine. So you go down, you know, get on miner's garb, <clears throat> you go down, hands by your side because nobody touches anybody else on the elevator, on the lift. You get in, they basically take all the tension off of it. You drop 6,900 feet in about two and a half minutes. And so you're standing in this cage, the rock wall is going by you at 50 miles an hour. Don't stick your hand out. You get to the bottom, it's incredibly dirty. And we built a clean room in the middle of this mine. So you get in, you hike in a uh, better part of a mile with your boots on and uh, overalls and everything. You get in, you have to strip, take a shower, put on clean, clean room garb, a hat and everything, because everything is immaculately clean in this. And the reason is all that dust and girt, dirt has a lot of radioactivity in it. We can't tolerate that in the experiment. So this is when we're building it. This is the fish bowl that contains, not yet here, but it did, uh, when it was finished, we put 1,000 tons of heavy water in it. It's covered with plastic here. Here's the support structure. And in order to purify this, <clears throat> we had to build, next one, uh, a cleaning plant, processing plant underground this is the cleanest water anywhere on Earth that you will find. Uh, we took the natural radioactivity elements in it and we reduced it by a factor of one billion. So all of, you know, except for one atom, we took out the other billion. Uh, again, underground, last one. And when we were done, <clears throat> next one, <clears throat> this is looking up at it. So here's the acrylic vessel. It's hung by Kevlar ropes here. It's filled with a, a kiloton of heavy water. And here's all the 9,456 eight inch photomultiplier tubes. This detector costs uh, a little over $100 million. Uh, took us 10 years to do this. But what we found out of this is, next one, a neutrino comes in, <clears throat> hits one of the uh, deuterium atoms, makes flashes of light, we pick those up in the photomultiplier tubes, and we reconstruct the energy and direction of the neutrino that came in. And the results, next one, <clears throat> is that we found that two-thirds of the electrons, neutrinos, starting off from the sun, change on their way coming to the Earth. They don't disappear, they change from one type into another. So just, you know, from an apple, two-thirds of them change into oranges. Next. <clears throat> Combined with other neutrino experiments, this tells us neutrinos have masses. For comparison, <clears throat> this is 10 million times lighter than an electron. So this is the lightest particle far and away uh, in the universe that we've ever observed. Last. <clears throat> and we know from this that neutrinos account for as much mass as the stars. So neutrinos were made during the Big Bang. They're filling the universe. They account for as much mass as all the stars, but they're the first dark matter to be observed, but there's still a very small amount of it. Bob? <clears throat> the other way to probe things <clears throat> is from space. So there's a satellite which is being prepared, sort of like this Hubble Space Telescope. It'll be put up into orbit, <clears throat> and it'll look very far out. It's got much more collecting power than this small little telescope down in southern New Mexico. 
And instead of reaching four or five billion years out, it'll be able to reach seven or eight billion years out, look at the supernova, <clears throat> and give us a much better idea of how the universe is expanding. Next one. So <clears throat> this is my final slide. It tells you what we know and what we don't know, which is mostly we don't know. <clears throat> So we don't know what dark matter is. We don't know how much the particles weigh. We don't know what they are, how strongly they interact, how many of them there are around. There's lots of theories. <clears throat> and some of these are really interesting. <clears throat> um, one's called WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles. They're big sort of like bowling balls compared to protons filling, running around the universe. Uh, axions, which uh, interact, uh, can interact magnetically. Supersymmetry, this is something that's quite interesting. So there's a theory that says there's another universe out there cohabiting our universe. We just only see half of the particles. The other particles are supersymmetric particles. So like an electron has an equivalent in this other sector called an S electron or selectron. Quarks are the same, they're called squarks. And those partners have different quantum mechanical properties. And we don't see them because they're all very heavy, much heavier than normal matter, and they've decayed away. But basically, we only know about half of what's in the universe. There may be another half that's out there that we haven't found yet. Um, Superstring theory <clears throat> says, well, particles aren't actually particles. They're actually uh, small strings. They're tension, uh, energy. They have an energy density associated with them. And these strings vibrate, and depending on how they vibrate, just like you get different pitches from a string on, on a guitar, depending on how they vibrate, they show up as a quark or an electron or something else. But so the quarks and electrons are all tied back to strings. <clears throat> and one of the ideas that comes out of this is that, you know, we have four dimensions that we observe regularly you know, up, down, left, right, backwards, forwards, and time is the fourth dimension. These say, well, there's actually 10 dimensions at the beginning of the universe. It's just that the other six dimensions all got shrunk down to very small scales, and we don't see them. We don't have enough sensitivity yet to see them. But there may be another whole universe, you know, right around us that we just can't see because we can't look carefully enough. So some, some really very interesting ideas here. Dark energy. Uh, we don't know its strength. Uh, we don't know if it changes with time. Um, Einstein postulated in general relativity the existence of a cosmological constant. He thought the universe should be static, and in order to do that, you needed to put another term into general relativity. He later called that his greatest mistake. It may be actually he was right, it's just that the sign is different than he thought it was. Um, but modifications of gravity and so on. Bob? <coughs> So, you know, bottom line is we don't know what 95% of the universe is made of, um, but we're working on it. Uh, we think we'll, you know, shed some light on this in the coming decades. And very last slide, you know, from my perspective, this is one of the reasons I became a physicist. I can't think of a more exciting time to get involved in understanding the mysteries of the universe. So with that, I'll stop and answer questions. <clears throat> Um, it's multispectral, so it goes from the red to, to the far blue. There's a spectrograph on it that splits it up. So yeah, so it looks from red to blue, but it, the visible region. Yeah, so when you look at our, at our universe, our universe is not 
it's not a bubble with a finite edge on it. We're at the center of our universe. Somebody at the edge of our, what we see as the edge of our universe would be looking at another universe. They'd see half of ours and half of the universe beyond that. So the belief is you know, that the universe is infinite. Um, we are constrained to looking out a certain distance because as you go further and further out, things shift more and more to the red, and eventually you get to a point where it takes forever for the light uh, to come to you. So during the, the very early uh, stage of the universe, during this inflation stage, um, the qu you can have actually the universe expanding faster than the speed of light uh, you know, on, on, on uh, universe scales, I mean scales of the universe. What you can't do is you can't transmit light from this point to another point at faster than the speed of light. So there's still causality, it's just relative motion. You don't, you don't violate general relativity or anything else by having something very far away moving at what looks like to you faster than the speed of light because you can't communicate with them you know, at anything faster than the speed of light. So th there's lots of, of theories. Some of them say that there are parallel universes separated you know, from our universe. Uh, there are theories that you can have wormholes between universes so that, for example, a black hole may be a connection to, uh, to another universe. Um, there's theories that say, well, you can go backwards in time, but not to your own universe. You gotta go, if you go backwards in time, you end up to another universe. You know, it's only limited by your imagination, I would say. The real question for scientists is, what can you demonstrate, what can you check to see whether or not it makes sense, and can you form a principle or a law, a physical law, that then allows you to predict new things that you can go out and check? Um, so for example, you know, what happened before inflation? What happened before the Big Bang? Um, that's sort of a philosophical discussion. Because uh, as far as we know, there's theories which say, oh yeah, the universe, you know, some universes expand out, they shrink, they do, you know, they just keep bounding back and forth forever and ever. There's no way you can test that. So it sort of becomes a, an act of faith whether or not you think those things happen. You know, what we're trying to do is understand, can we observe what's going on and put that into a sensical form that makes laws of physics or laws of nature that we can then predict other things from. Well, we know what matter is, but what is antimatter? So antimatter has <clears throat> all the, it's matter in which the quantum properties of it are just the opposite. So like if you have a positive charge, it's got a negative charge to it. Um, in addition to charge, it's got something called a baryon number, which says this is matter, and antimatter has the opposite baryon number. So in quantum mechanics, there's several different properties which define the, the properties, or several different quantities which define the properties of particles. And if, to, to make an antiparticle, you just take all those properties and you flip the sign. You make an anti one, and when you bring them together, they annihilate and just make pure energy. Oh, sorry. Yep. Is it possible to synthetically produce antimatter to make more matter? Yeah. Um, particle accelerators uh, do that all the time, um, including the, the one that I showed you there uh, out, out on Long Island. The problem is, you know, people talk about, well, let's make antimatter and, you know, you could fuel, you know, all kinds of things with it. The problem is that to, in, in order to make sort of a gram of antimatter, it would take all of the energy in the world something like a thousand years. Dang. It's very inefficient. <laughs> so, you know, when you watch Star Trek and all of that, you know, it's like, well, nice idea, but it doesn't actually really work. Very good question. <laughs> People are, yeah, uh, 
people are, are arguing that, they're trying to do experiments, and there's two schools of thought, one that says, yes, they're exactly the same particle, and the other school says, no, they still have separate quantum numbers, and therefore, they're separate. And whether it's one type, or whether there's one way or the other actually changes the way things radioactively decay, so people are doing very sensitive experiments to try and figure that out. Great question. Mm -hmm. uh, you said there was 10 dimensions. What, we define you know, the second dimension as a flat string, or the first as a line. Yep. What would the 10 be? Like, the what, what, what would it look like, you mean? Yeah. Or <clears throat> I mean, it's very, very good question. Um, so one example that, that I heard given is, you know, if you look at, <clears throat> at a tin can, say, a long, you know, cylinder or a tin can, from a long distance, it would just look like a straight line. It wouldn't look like it had any extent. As you get closer and closer and you can, you know, look at it more carefully, you see, actually, it's a cylinder. It's got, you know, dimension this way. What the other dimensions would actually, you know, to our senses look like, I mean, you can't see them directly. You have to use very sophisticated apparatus. Um, I don't know what they'd look like. <laughs> <clears throat> mm -hmm. In terms of science uh, in the world, and so I'll, I'll sort of take off my scientist hat in part uh, and put on, you know, my, uh, uh, my international relations hat or something. All of these types of experiments that I showed you, that people have worked on, that I've worked on, all involve international collaborations, people working together from many, many different countries. And science on that scale really transcends political boundaries, ideologies, it doesn't matter, you know, what your race, your gender, your religious beliefs are, or anything else. It's people working together to try and figure out what is real and what isn't in the world around us. And it's a great lifestyle, I have to say. Um, you know, Bob and I have spent a lot of our time in these collaborations. Uh, I've worked in, in Russia, I've worked in Canada, uh, I've worked in Italy, just outside of Rome. That was about the nicest place to work. Um, you collaborate and work with people all over.